Chapter 391 Ambassadors, 1. There had been a coup in Albahar. Prince Beck had led it, seeing his chances of becoming Beast King dwindle. While the rebellion had been stopped, Beck had managed to steal the Beast King's emblem, a set of equipment only the Beast King could wear. And it seemed like the Prostia Empire had been helping him from the shadows. Alan's party needed to get into Prostia somehow. They needed to retrieve the stolen Beast King's emblem, which was a set of Orichalcum knuckle guards, Orichalcum armor, and Kuatoro's sacred bead. Paromus also wanted to get his hands on Macra's sacred bead, to fulfill his promise to Fiona and marry her. Everyone had a reason to get into Prostia, but it was a hard place to visit, being an empire of mermen. Other races needed a special pass from Prostia to enter. With that pass, the owners would receive Aqua's blessing and be able to breathe underwater like mermen, even down in the bottom of the ocean where Prostia was located. Kleber, a vassal country of Prostias, also had the ability of giving out passes, but those did not have Aqua's blessing, so it was useless for any race other than mermen. Such were the situations surrounding them, so Kleber's royal family and all the officers and knights present were shocked seeing Alan transform into a merman in front of their eyes. Alan, does that really change your race too? Yeah, just look at my streamlined and sleek body. He showed off the new features of his body with a special pose, letting everyone see he was now a merman. Oh. So cool. I know, I look so cool, right? Merle's eyes were twinkling, having learned a new pose to add to her repertoire. Ah, uh, Alan. Just make sure you don't stop being human though, I don't know how this might end. Cecile was slightly bothered seeing Alan's new appearance and the pose he struck. Shay had tried to request entry passes into Prostia through Kleber before, but the Empire had rejected any petition. There was nothing more Kleber could do to appeal the petition, so there was no way for them to enter anymore. That was when Alan began to think of alternatives. In the end, he decided to show his friends a skill he obtained, but never really showed them. Okay good, I think this is really the best way after all. Alan was thinking of various means to enter into Prostia. The plan he came up to was something he felt was an obvious solution, thanks to all the memories from his past life. There were places that could not be accessed with ships or magic ships too. Other places were accessible with the means of transportation available, but the people there detested humans. At first, he decided to ask Larapa to develop a magic device that would allow them to breathe underwater. But when it was completed, it ended up looking almost like a spacesuit. Other mermen would be really suspicious if they wore that. The next option he thought of was the fish A's special skill, Mimic. With it, they could even transform into sea dragons that lived underwater, allowing them to reach the bottom of the ocean. Alan had done even more experiments with the skill though. Properties of Mimic It allowed the transformation into any monster A rank or less, within a 1 km radius from the summon. Alan decided into what to transform. He could transform into any monster he saw before. The effect lasted for 24 hours. It was possible to inherit the stats, skills, and abilities of the monster. Once transformed, one's original skills and extra skills became unusable. It was basically a complete transformation into a monster, getting rid of the human skills and extra skills the user had before. Alan could even turn the 5,000 members of his army into white dragons if he wanted. I don't think I would have ever wanted to become a merman if I wasn't in this situation though. Alan had focused on examining a rank monsters and had never thought of transforming into other races. But now he and the party had a need to go underwater to Prostia. He decided to try turning into a merman to see if he would be able to breathe underwater too, and it worked flawlessly. He also discovered he could turn into any other race he encountered before as well, like beastmen, elves, or dark elves. He had also fought at least three demons during the invasion of Rosenheim, including Glaster, which worked but transforming into a high elf or high dark elf did not work. His theory about that was that those races were specifically blessed by the spirit king or spirit god, making it impossible for him to turn into one of them. When he transformed into a demon, his summon skill became unusable. He was not sure if that was because that skill tree did not exist amongst demons, or because they lived under different rules to the other races. How long will it take for the passes to be ready? I hope it doesn't take too long. Kleber's king had already said he could give them the passes. Alan stared into his eyes, essentially telling him he could not back down on his word now that they could turn into mermen. Hum, it shouldn't take very long if I start getting them ready right now. He was still taken aback by what he saw, but he had no intention of going back on his word. So we can get the passes then. 
That's what I like to hear. There were multiple ways of reaching Prostia. But this was the easiest and most efficient way. Even if he could become a merman, he did not want to raise any suspicion by entering illegally. Thank you very much. You you're welcome. D do you need anything else? Alan was still staring at the king. Considering the relationship between Prostia and Kleber, the king's choice would certainly anger them, but it would seem minor compared to Alan's next request. To be honest, I have one more request. Alan wanted one other thing different from the entry passes. You're the heroes that rescued my people from the evil cult, we'll do anything in our power to help you. Oh. Nice. Thanks to Alan, more than a million people from Kleber had been spared from the pagan worshippers. He had obtained Macris' sacred bead as thanks for that, but the royal family still felt indebted to him. Then could you name us ambassadors of Kleber when we enter Prostia? Ambassadors? Hearing that, Shay was able to guess Alan's plan. Even though they could appear as mermen now, they still had no real pretext to obtain the pass. Receiving the pass was important, but they needed more to get anywhere in Prostia. But being ambassadors could easily fix that. So you want us to enter Prostia as servants of Kleber then, Master Alan? Yes, that's exactly it, Sophie. I wonder how you come up with such evil schemes. It's human nature to be evil, Seal. And I haven't gotten everything I want yet. Sophie understood what Alan's plan entailed. Prince Beck seemed to have connections with Prostia. Considering he was the crown prince for a while, whoever he was talking to in Prostia had to be in a high position as well. Getting a basic pass from Kleber might end up limiting the extent Alan could investigate. Kleber was a vassal country of Prostia, but being an ambassador would give them more freedom, though Cecile still felt annoyed with Alan's demands. Also, make it an ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary. Clank. What? E extraordinary? The king understood there were special circumstances, so Alan's request did not sound too outrageous. He was still trying to process that when Alan added even more conditions to it though. Fa father? The king was in so much shock he sprung on his feet, sending his chair flying back. That also affected the queen and princess Carmen, who stood up and tried to calm him. Is that too much? I don't intend on doing anything that could harm Kleber, so could you please consider it? Alan tried to speak a bit more slowly, calming and coercing the king. The king placed a hand on his luxurious vest and took deep breaths to calm himself down. The title Alan was seeking, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary, was the highest position for anyone dealing with foreign relationships for a country. It was essentially on the same level as the leader of a country. Alan was asking to enter Prostia with the same benefits the king would have. The king was struggling to weigh his decision. Alan commanded power over countless bees the size of dragons and had killed hundreds of thousands of pagan worshippers and monsters in a few days. He had also fought toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Beast King in front of the representatives of a hundred countries, leaving the arena they fought in shattered and unusable. If Alan overstepped just a little during his stay in Prostia, it would create a mess for Kleber. Hum. The King could not give an immediate reply considering the importance of that role. I sense unrest brewing in Prostia. I promise my army will do its best to protect you no matter what happens. This entire issue was between Albahar and Prostia, and there had been armed presence already. Prostia's men had directly attacked the Beast King's palace, without prior warning. On top of that, they had aided with the theft of an important set of items. If it was just a small portion of Prostia helping back, then everything would end once they were taken care of, but if the Empire as a whole was aiding him, it was a different story. Things would easily escalate to the point of an all-out war between land and ocean. Al-Bahar would be leading the attack. The king recalled the message he got from Al-Bahar through a magic device earlier. The person tending to the device had said that the caller sounded extremely enraged. Kleber was always the first country that sprung to mind when one thought of mermen. It was the only merman country on the surface after all. The attack had left Albahar's royal palace filled with blood, and the race for the throne had been sullied, so they were dead set on getting revenge. They were angered enough to kill everyone involved with the attack, and their bloodlust was obvious even through the magic device. There was a strong need to investigate in Prostia first, but Alan promised he would defend Kleber no matter what happened. You want to be an ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary, right? Yes. The king hoped Alan would soften his decision if he asked again, but Alan sounded just as resolute as before. 
the king took a deep breath and continued pondering what would happen to Kleber and how they should act in this situation. If it's not too much to ask for, I'd like to go to Prostia with them as well. Wah! Carmen! In the end, Princess Carmen forced her way into the conversation. Chapter 392 Ambassadors, 2 The king was still debating whether or not to grant the title of Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to Alan when Princess Carmen made up her mind and interrupted him. Wouldn't that be an ideal solution, father? Oh! She'll cover for us then? Carmen? I'll go with them to Prostia, as Princess of Kleber. Considering everything that happened, Kleber's future is at risk as well. It was our failure as Kleber's royal family that the evil cult spread in our country as well, losing Prostia's trust in the process. Princess Carmen always had Kleber's future in her mind. The merman prayed to the goddess of water aqua. That did not change whether in Kleber or Prostia. But Kleber's residents began to stray from Aqua and began joining the evil cult, opposing Prostia's mandates. That led to Prostia holding Kleber in less esteem than previously. More than a year had passed since the last time a Kleber royal had set foot in Prostia's palace. At this rate, they would only continue losing trust from Prostia. Princess Carmen firmly believed they had to maintain their position as a vassal country, for the safety of their people. You do have a point. Hum hum, having Carmen with us would be helpful. It'd complete our disguise. If Alan's party alone entered Prostia as ambassadors of the highest level, it would be very easy to raise suspicion as they were unfamiliar with merman culture and lifestyle. Still, Alan believed he could talk his way out of any issue. Even if they raised suspicion and they had to use force to make their way through, Alan did not care what happened as long as he retrieved the stolen Beast King's emblem. Having Princess Carmen with them would make things easier though. Also, we haven't heard from Lord Dreskelet in a while. Dreskelet? Excuse me? Alan wanted to know who they were talking about. Oh, I'm sorry Lord Alan. Princess Carmen then began telling him about her own issues and the situation of the country. The ruler of Kleber was always given the title of king or queen by Prostia. Prostia had prepared a duke called Dreskelet to marry Princess Carmen and become the next king of Kleber, but their talks had stopped after the issue with the cultists. If they did nothing to re-establish contact, the marriage would fall through, which could affect Kleber negatively. At this point, the only way to move forward would be for Prince Carmen to visit him in Prostia herself. Now she suggested she go with Alan's party as her personal guards and delegation. Going as her personal guards would also give us the freedom we need, I see. Alan would get to enter Prostia, while Princess Carmen would complete her visit to save Kleber's future, both goals could be accomplished at the same time. Yes yes, you have a point. This is our duty as royalty as well. Knight Commander Iwanam, could you accompany them as well? If you order it, anything for you my lord. Eh all right, you should go then. Princess Carmen managed to convince the king. Her reasoning made perfect sense, so he was on board with letting her go to Prostia. He decided to send the Knight Commander Iwanam, who stood behind him, together with the princess as her bodyguard. Oh, some token old men could be valuable as well. Alan's party would be going to Prostia, but the average age of the party was rather low. If everyone was so young, it could also raise suspicion, so having a couple of old men in the knight commander and his knights with them would be helpful. At the same time that gave them more time to learn Prostia's culture and lifestyle. The entire thing felt a bit random overall, but at least the king seemed satisfied. This way, Alan's party would transform into mermen, be named ambassadors extraordinary and plenipotentiary, and go visit Prostia together with Princess Carmen. Five days later everything was ready for their departure. That was longer than Alan had hoped for, but considering they needed to contact Prostia and tell them about the visit, and load the cargo for the trip, it was actually a short time. Hum, so this is the ship they used to visit Prostia. It looks pretty big, but also rather normal. Alan looked at the enormous ship anchored at the port. They would travel to Prostia in the bottom of the ocean aboard it, but to Alan it just looked like an average large ship. The only difference was that the oars were located at a higher spot, making it easier to navigate underwater. Most of the cargo they were carrying was a tribute to Prostia, given Kleber's status as a vassal country. All of Prostia's international trade was conducted through Kleber, Prostia's minerals and precious metals being sold exclusively in Kleber. Kleber would then use the profits to buy whatever Prostia needed and ship it together with a tribute back to Prostia. Such shipments happened many times during a year. 
sometimes the entire ship was loaded with items when it departed. Still, the harbor is quite close to Kleber's capital. I wonder why they chose to escape inland before. Alan looked at the ship as he realized something. Kleber's capital was located really close to the harbor, probably to facilitate shipments with Prostia. When the cultists began turning into pagan worshippers and attacking the other mermen, everyone began fleeing further into the land, even though the sea would probably be safer. There were not enough ships on the harbor to house all the refugees from the capital, but that was no reason to just swim away. The truth was that the sea was infested with sea monsters, so if the refugees swimming were attacked, they would be unable to flee back on land. That was why the royal family formed that convoy of more than a million mermen and began fleeing inland. It was also during that time that Alan and Shay met up. Zhu and Shay's fortunes. I guess it's all the god of fortune, no, god of fate's work. At the same time, Alan began to think about astrologer Temi's readings. If she had not told Zhu he would become beast king, he would have never gone to the S-rank dungeon. Then she gave Shay a task in the continent with the confederation. Without that, Alan and Shay would have never met. It was only thanks to Temi's readings for both Zhu and Shay that Alan was able to meet them and work with them. Alan felt like the god of fate, one of the principal deities in this world, had crafted quite elaborate quests for all of them. It seems we're departing soon. Alan was still thinking about Kleber's royal family and Temi's readings when Shay spoke to him, transformed into a mermaid. So it's time already. Shay, are you sure you don't want to return to Albahar yet? Yeah, don't worry. Lud is taking care of that. There had been all sorts of conversations during the last five days, and they were able to check on Albahar's situation a bit more. Lud had once been part of the Beast King's personal guard, so he was a good pick to visit Albahar. Things had largely calmed down in the capital, but many beast men with short tempers were constantly trying to chase after Beck. Beck's whereabouts were still unknown, but three days after the attack he had been officially stripped of his title of Crown Prince. But there were still no traces of where Beck fled to. An investigation in the eastern borders of Albahar found that a large ship had been anchored near a cliff there for many days. The day the attack happened, the large ship also vanished like it had never been there. At least that was everything Shay had been told so far. Are there people trying to get revenge from Kleber or Prostia yet? There are. Many beast men were saying things like the mermen will pay with their blood for the blood they spilled. Albahar was currently treating Kleber and Albahar as a single entity. It was also hard for Kleber to prove their innocence, as they had no proof of it. Alan was starting to feel like the armies of every country were easy to rile up. While they disagreed on many things, the soldiers in Albahar's capital all agreed on their want for revenge. Though well, if they actually decide to attack, they'll need to rescind their position in the Five Continents Alliance as well. That's why they're still discussing that. They know they have to be careful with the alliance. They had announced Zhu and the Ten Heroic Beasts' participation in defending Rosenheim and the Central Continent from the Demon King's army during the last meeting. Everyone commended Albahar's efforts and cooperation in the war, since they used to be a country that never participated in such fights. But if they attacked Kleber, this year's representative of the Confederation, the Alliance's opinion of Albahar would change dramatically. They would most likely expel Albahar from the Alliance. Hum, so the Five Continents Alliance will also get involved. I'll have to talk with Rosenheim's queen as well then. Alan began to think of one possibility. Beck's goal by stealing the Beast King's emblem was still unknown, so Alan was constantly coming up with theories to be prepared with any situation. I'll tell Rosenheim's queen to talk with Albahar as well then. And Lud should continue keeping watch over things in Albahar. Sounds good. Hum, everyone's boarding now. All the cargo had been loaded, so now the mermen were starting to climb the ladders and entering the ship. The ship would set sail soon. Well, good luck out there then. I'll do my best as the commander of special attack units too. Saying that, Karina puffed her chest before saying goodbye. Yeah, I'm leaving Alan's army in your hands. And Dagora's too. You can count on us. Dagora is starting to look more reliable lately. Alan turned to look at Dagora next. He just nodded, knowing his duties. Alan's party was splitting into two now. Team Prostia was led by Alan and composed by Cecile, Sophie, Fermar, Shay, Luck, and Paromis. Team Alan's army was led by Kiel and composed by Karina, Dagora, Merle, and Marus. The reason for the split was so that Kiel's team could watch over Alan's army. 
everyone in Alan's army had already undergone a talent change. Dogora, you're really close to reaching level 96, so just keep going until you max it out, got it? Got it. Dogora had not reached his level cap yet, and that was another reason why Alan left him back. He wanted Dogora to keep hunting iron golems until he reached the limits of extra mode. No one knew just how high it could get, but Dagora's level had already surpassed Alan's and it just kept going up. Meanwhile, Team Prostia would need to sneak around a lot, so Alan selected members who could move silently the easiest. All the members of his army had their own roles they excelled at. Alan was still talking to them when Shay approached Dagora. And remember to eat a varied diet, okay? She spoke with her usual voice for Dagora, sounding a bit worried. Yeah, I know. Dagora's reply was slightly disinterested, but his usual bothered tone was gone. All the preparations were done, so the members of Team Prostia entered a small boat. That carried them to the large ship, and they climbed into it before heading to Prostia. Chapter 393 Prostia Empire Alan's group had already transformed into mermen when they began climbing the ladders and boarding the enormous ship. Karina and the remainder of the party watched from the shore until they vanished in the horizon, and then Marius teleported them back to the S-rank dungeon. The interior looks normal too. They were led to a rather luxurious room, where Alan sat down and surveyed his surroundings. Just like the outside of the ship, the interior looked like that of a regular ship. This is so cool! Will this really go underwater? Yes, at least that's what they said. Usually Karina and Merle were the easiest to get excited in the party, but now there was only Luck, who was staring at the thick windows on the wall. The windows were made of glass, so the outside was clearly visible. Hum, I guess walking around the ship is the thing to do now. Alan had flown in magic ships before, but this was his first time in such a large maritime ship. In his past life, he would have only boarded such a ship to travel to a different continent or when beginning a new adventure. He felt like every time that happened, he was allowed to walk inside the ship too. The rest of the group also looked around the room, while Shay just looked out of the window to the spot Dagora stood when they left. I'm sure they'll do just fine. Cecile decided to try comforting Shay. You're right. Dagora is there, so it should be fine. Shay said that it would be all right since Dagora was there. Alan had split the party in two so that Alan's army could continue growing stronger. It had been half a year since Alan's army was created, and they had been focusing on clearing the A-rank dungeons first. Now that everyone had undergone a talent change, they were starting to conduct joint training amongst Beastmen, Elves, and Dark Elves. But considering their skill levels would stagnate, it was not very efficient to do that for too long. The talent change had resetted their skill levels to one, so they took some time to raise them before starting to hunt Iron Golems. But there was another reason why Alan had left Kiel's group behind with Alan's army. There had been movements around Jayamud in the central continent. An army of a thousand had been started, with Helmios at the helm. Doberg, who had also been in the S-rank dungeon, was part of it as well. They were called the Heroes' Army. Jayamud's emperor had personally appointed each member and wanted them to become a symbol of hope during the fight against the Demon King's army. It was around half a year since the Talent Change dungeon opened. They seemed to be taking a lot of notes from how Alan's army was working, picking only soldiers with talents, and rather than freely letting them undergo a talent change, it was obligatory. With their priorities decided, they formed the core members with Helmios and others with three-star talents, had them undergo talent changes, and created an army. But just like Alan's army, a majority of the members started with two-star talents. So far, their selection of members, talent changes, and training was progressing smoothly. It seemed like Alan's show during the Five Continents Alliance had spurred him on a lot. Not just Alan, but Dogora had left quite an impression as well, having fought the Beast King until almost defeating him even though Helmios had struggled so much. Alan was also giving Helmios information about Alan's army and how life was going for them. He also offered information about the talent change dungeon's peculiarities and how to hunt a rank monsters or demon generals as an army. Alan's goal was to fight the Demon King's army and defeat the Demon King. He offered all the information for free, and it was up to Helmios and Jayamut's emperor to use it or not. Alan wanted the fight with he Demon King's army to have as little casualties as possible. On top of all that, he was also helping Granvel's Knight Commander Zinov and Deputy Knight Commander Raybrand undergo their own talent changes. After all, stats and equipment decided everything in this world. 
he had given them adamantite weapons and armor, so they had gotten considerably strong. Sometime after Alan provided all the information, Helmios contacted Alan again. He offered for both armies to train together. Alan accepted instantly, since that would strengthen both sides. While the Demon King's army attacks had stopped in April, they could start again any time. Alan agreed that this was the time to focus on bolstering their defenses against them. It would not take much longer for the Heroes Army 1000 soldiers to be ready for the S-rank dungeon after having undergone talent changes. The Heroes Army only had 1000 members now, but they were planning on gathering many times that number in the future. After the strong impression Alan left on the Emperor, he was trying his best to build an army that could carry his empire's future. The Elf General Lucidral and Beastman General Lud could not watch over that joint training alone. Alan was going to Prostia, but some of his friends would stay behind to take care of that. The hero's army would learn Dagora's true power through that training. They would finally understand that he had not shown his true power when he fought before. And if they began fearing Dagora, Alan hoped that would translate into worship to Freya. Knowing all of that, Shay could not refuse to part ways with Dagora. Shay decided to let Dagora take care of Alan's army. Though well, Kiel is the actual team leader. Even though Dagora had entered extra mode and reached level 95, he was not the leader. Everyone had their own skill sets, and Kiel was more suited for that role. I guess I should look for a room with no vases or furniture. Alan felt like rooms that travelers were expected to occupy would always have furniture and vases. We'll be setting sail soon. Let's talk a bit about our future plans. Okay. Luck had his face glued to the window, but hearing that he quickly turned around and sat down. Everyone else also gathered around the table in front of Alan. So Shay, can we proceed under the assumption that Beck hasn't moved at all since then? Yes. I don't know what he's planning, but he seems to be laying low for now. Though Albahar has its hands tied for the time being as well. Alan wanted to know what more Lud had told Shay. She did not seem to mind hearing Alan refer to Beck by name. I see. By having its hands tied, do you mean they fear a full-on military response from Prostia? It seemed like Albahar's situation was related to Beck's allegiances. Basically yes, they have no option but to keep still until more information surfaces. I see, so that's why the Beast Man haven't showed so much of a response yet. After attacking Albahar's capital with the help of Merman, Beck remained completely still for five days. And there seemed to be a reason why Albahar had not simply charged into Kleber demanding revenge. If they attacked Kleber, it was easy to imagine Prostia would use that as an opening to attack Albahar instead. Albahar feared that Beck was planning a second attack on Albahar. Beck had lost his chance to become Beast King as soon as discussions started. Now it was hard to say exactly what he would do next. Albahar had never expected they might need to fight Prostia, which was located in the bottom of the ocean. They did not have any means to attack them, so their best option was to wait for Prostia to take the first step. So Albahar won't do anything for the time being? Yes, unless Beck does something. But Alan, Prostia isn't the only country under the ocean, is it? Cecile also joined the conversation. Not really, they're essentially all under Prostia's control, though we'll know more during our investigation. There were many things that Alan had learned from Kleber's royal family too. Prostia was a large empire at the bottom of the ocean. They controlled a large territory, which spanned from the surroundings of the continent with the Confederation and all between the three central continents. As an empire, Prostia had control over many territories, which could be thought of as provinces. Just like how Kleber was on the surface, they also had other vassal countries under the ocean. There was a possibility one of those provinces or vassal countries had gone rogue. But Alan just said that was something they would need to figure out while they investigated. We're about to submerge and head towards Prostia's imperial capital, Patlanta. Alan's group was still discussing what they had to do when a magic device broadcasted a message. Everything was loaded and secured in the large ship, so it was about to submerge. The horizon seemed to get raised outside the window, which made Luck's heart beat faster and faster. His body language showed just how bored he had gotten doing nothing but study and clearing dungeons. Are we really going to be okay? You did test whether we can breathe underwater in this form, right? The walls were filled with holes, salty ocean water starting to pour through them. Alan had verified that once transformed into a merman, he could breathe underwater. But that did not ease any of the anxiety they felt as the water level continued to rise in the room. 
Most lakes and rivers in this world had clean water, but the ocean had a decent concentration of salt. That salty water had filled the room up to their chests. Master Alan says it'll be okay. Sophie tried telling Cecile to not worry. Sophie looked like a mermaid holding a prawn, and while she felt anxious, she also tried convincing herself it would be fine. The room eventually filled completely with water, but everyone was still okay. Haha, <laughs> I'll never get bored around Alan. That's good to know. I'm glad you're doing fine as well, Rosen. I never had to breathe in the first place after all. Everyone in the room was breathing normally, even though the room was filled with water. Alan's fish as summoned special skill, Mimic, had also turned the spirit god Rosen into a prawn. Rosen had no issues either. Sophie and Luck were going to Prostia with Alan, so the spirit god Rosen and spirit king Fabre accompanied them. Spirit gods and spirit kings had no need to breathe or eat, but there were no sea animals that looked like squirrels or weasels. Mimic changed Rosen into a prawn, while Fabre was turned into a crab. Mermen had two holes on the root of their necks, which aided them in capturing the oxygen from the water. That was how they could live both on land and sea. Hum, so it was true that the inside of the ships gets filled with water too. I guess it makes sense since they all live underwater. They had no issues breathing, even though the interior of the ship had gotten completely filled with water. Apparently, the ship's needing to be filled with water was also dictated by Prostia's law. It was one of the measures taken so no people from other races could sneak into Prostia. It's getting darker outside too. I guess sunlight doesn't reach all the way down here. The enormous ship headed away from the coast while gaining more depth. The windows gradually became dimmer until there was only darkness outside. How deep does sunlight usually reach underwater? Was it 100 or 200 meters again? Alan had heard that sunlight did not reach Prostia's imperial capital, Patlanta. They continued traveling in darkness for a while until the windows looked brighter again. Oh! What is it, what is it? The light illuminated the entire room and Luck hurried to look out of the window. The seaweeds at the seabed were glowing. So those are crystal flowers. They're so pretty. I know. It's a sight to behold. Luck and Sophie were impressed with the sight. Alan was glad to see an elf and a dark elf agreeing on something. I think this world's corals or something glow, right? At first, Alan imagined Prostia was a rather gloomy place, located so deep under the ocean that there was no sunlight. But according to what he learned in Clabur, that was not the case at all, there was a bright glow in the bottom of the ocean. A form of sea vegetation grew everywhere, which looked like a flower with crystal petals that glow brightly. Schools of fish usually gathered around those flowers, forming large groups. The closer they got to Prostia, the more wondrous the place looked. Chapter 394 Imperial Capital Patlanta The ship Alan's group boarded traveled a few dozen meters above the seabed, cruising for many days. Alan was unable to return to the surface during those days, staying in the boat all the time. Luck, what are you doing all morning? Is that fun? Alan's friends also got used to life underwater. After waking up, Cecile visited the room where everyone stayed during the day, seeing Luck playing inside. Yeah, do you want to try too? I'm good. It's almost time to eat. Luck swimming up close to the ceiling, his back facing down as he circled around the room. He seemed to be enjoying the feeling of weightlessness. Cecile told Luck to get down soon so he could eat breakfast. The bottom of the ocean had been a mesmerizing sight at first, but now no one paid it any attention. Alan felt like any scenery could grow stale and boring after enough time. All right, this month I'll reach skill level 9 with Summoner, for sure. Alan had been inside the ship for many days already, traveling underwater. During all those days, he had been unable to go help Kiel's team with hunting Bordino or the Iron Golems. If he really needed to, Alan could use the bird as summons awakened skill, homing instinct, to travel to the S-rank dungeon from the ship. But having defeated Gordino so many times, he had obtained enough valuable items. He felt like focusing on leveling up his summoner skill was more important now. At first, he was considering using Meru's help and reach skill level 9 by December, but then he ended up having to go to Prostia. He decided to use all the downtime during the trip to reach that level even faster. He had also started using Paromas Company's connections to buy up magic stones from all over the world. They were obtaining many items from hunting iron golems, but not all of them could be used in his army or to aid the townsfolk of the island. 
So he decided to use the excess to buy magic stones, which he would use to gain skill experience to level up his summoner skill. He also had Meru's constantly making mana seeds, which were placed into their inventory. Meru's eyes were starting to look devoid of life lately. I see everyone is here. Breakfast will be served shortly. The servants from Kleber brought in their breakfast. Oh! Slightly swollen bread was brought on plates, which seemed to sway in the current. Luck answered energetically as he headed down to his seat. Everyone was eating breakfast together. Alan, happy birthday. We have to throw a proper party tonight. Hum? Ah, oh, thanks. Everyone was still eating when Cecile congratulated Alan. It was November 1st, meaning Alan had just turned 16. Oh, you're right. Congratulations, Master Alan. Sophie also seemed to remember, congratulating him after Cecile. High elves could live for more than a thousand years, so unlike humans, they cared little about birthdays. Hum? How old is Alan now then? Sixteen. Oh! Sixteen! Congratulations! Luck also joined in. They were eating underwater and talking a lot, so their food was starting to drift away. There was water all around them and it was easy to get particles floating around like there was a strong wind, so apparently eating carefully was a big point of merman manners. Since they were underwater, even things that usually were too heavy for wind would drift around. That was another reason why soups were essentially never eaten there. Their diet focused heavily on not dirtying the water. Rather than an air purifier, they had a small magic device that cleaned the water. That magic device took care of eliminating any gunk that was produced by their bodies. Such things were necessary for merman life. That was another reason why Alan had installed that large water purifier in Heavy User Island. If the water was not kept clean, infections and other diseases could spread quickly. That was very important for life underwater, so mermen were always buying magic devices from Bakis. Such necessities were another reason why Kleber was built, enabling trade with other countries on the surface. Now that Alan was a merman as well, he started caring a lot more for water quality. Maybe that was another trait transforming into a merman brought forth. Hum? What's wrong? Shay noticed a change in Alan's countenance. The moment he mentioned being 16, he seemed to remember something. Oh, it's nothing, just thinking that I'm finally 16. In my world, when someone turns 16, their mom wakes them up early in the morning and takes them to the castle. I was just thinking that I'm 16 here now too. Oh. You go to the castle at 16? Usually Alan never spoke about his past life, but he mentioned it now. And it was a rather bizarre topic at that. Shay had been told before that Alan came from a different world. The god of creation Elmia had brought him from another world, so he could defeat the demon king here. There were no other people that came from a different world here, so it was an unprecedented event. Alan had scoured the academy's library for any stories of past heroes, looking for any story or legend that suggested someone came from a different world, but found nothing. It was a bizarre story, but at least Shay believed it was true. Mostly because she had been present when Alan and Kubel talked with each other, back when Gushera was occupying the floating island. After that strange conversation, they had to fight Gushera. There was the fight with the Beast King too. Alan's decision to terraform Heavy User Island and get people living there. His goals seemed to always be well-defined, pushing him to cooperate with the hero's army to defeat the Demon King more easily too. Now she was wondering just why Alan would be taken to a castle at 16. Ah, well in my world when you turn 16, the king gives you a small allowance and sends you away from your hometown to defeat the Demon King. Actually no, it's not everyone, it's just that my father was a hero. Shay and everyone else's gazes fixated on him, so Alan had to continue talking somehow. As he spoke, he felt like that story felt rather hellmode too. Oh, so you come from a family of heroes. And then you managed to defeat the Demon King. Shay and the rest were starting to believe that there was no Demon King Alan could not defeat. This was all a half-joke for Alan, but he still wanted everyone to believe he could defeat the Demon King. Okay, I'm kidding, it's a joke. What are you saying? Don't feel embarrassed now, feel proud of it even if it happened in a different world. Shay told him to keep his head high. Oh, they actually took it seriously. That made Alan think of his actual father. His father had worked hard every day, just so Alan could spend the entire day playing games. He was similarly grateful to him as to Rodden. 
Alan was 35 when he came to this world, and he hoped the rest of his father's life was a calm one. Slowly memories of his father came rushing back. He had just intended to joke a bit, but now he could not stop thinking about him. So your father back there was also a hero. Cecile felt like she was starting to understand why Alan felt so much gratitude for Rodden. As Cecile grew up, some of Alan's actions started to make sense. Alan greatly valued his family. Now she understood that his past memories fueled that. Yeah, I guess so. Unlike me. He denied being one himself, but he called his past father a hero. I'm sure you'll become one too. Or actually, you're one already. He had stopped Rosenheim's invasion and defeated the evil cult. His friends began to wonder just what his family was like, for him to deny being a hero so fervently. Everyone aboard, sorry for the long wait. We'll be arriving at the imperial capital of Patlanta shortly, everything's on schedule. As if interrupting their conversation, a broadcast was sent through the magic devices. Those magic devices had been built in Bakis as well. Kleber's royal family had told him they were quite expensive, since they needed to work underwater. Imperial capital Patlanta? Oh, cool. There's a city on top of a flower. Luck stood up and went to look out of the window, a breathtaking scene awaiting outside. Alan and the rest also went to the window. There was a giant crystal flower, more than a hundred kilometers in size, with a city built on top. There were around a million mermen living on top of that crystal flower. Oh oh, so Prostia's capital is essentially built on top of coral. Alan felt like there were many details he had not been told. The ship began lowering its speed as it neared the port. After some time, thick and large chains were wrapped around the ship to keep it from drifting. I wonder if we can step out now. They had arrived at Patlanta safely, so Alan already thought of his next move. Once they were out of the ship, they headed to the place where all the cargo from Kleber for Prostia would be offloaded. Seriously, why did you have to come at this time? Come on, move faster. The next ship is about to arrive. Some important official was there, in charge of looking over all the tributes offered to Prostia, while constantly complaining about everything. From his get-up and attitude it was easy to guess this port was heavily used, and quite important. All the cargo for Prostia on the ship had been picked in a rush. But there were other vassal countries and provinces that had to pay tributes to Patlanta. Everything was gathered in Prostia, for the emperor. Patlanta was the hub where all the tributes from other countries and provinces were gathered. Every year they also had tributes to pay. Because of that, there was a constant flow of ships arriving at the port. Oh, so he's the one in charge of this port. The reason why the official was so angry was that there was a large backlog of ships arriving, but Kleber had ignored that schedule and arrived without asking. The official showed his emotions bluntly, angrily shouting instructions to the workers around him, so Alan frowned and approached him. What does this mean? We come here in such a rush and this is the reception we get? Hum? And who are you supposed to be? The official was confused, this was his first time seeing Alan. I'm Alec, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary. I came together with a suitable tribute. I'll have to make sure I don't forget my fake name. Alec, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary? The official looked at him with even more suspicion, having never heard that name before. Yes, I'm paying a visit here, representing His Majesty the King of Kleber. With that, Alan's conversation with the official checking the tribute started.